Bibles to Acts chapter 4. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 13. While Peter and John were speaking to the people, they were confronted by the priest, the captain of the temple guards, and some of the Sadducees. These leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the people that through Jesus there is a resurrection of the dead. They arrested them, and since it was already evening, put them in jail until morning. But many of the people who heard their message believed it. So the number of men who believed now totaled 5,000. The next day, the council of all the rulers and elders and teachers of religious law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, along with Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and other relatives of the high priest. They brought to the two disciples, brought in the two disciples and demanded, By what power or in whose name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, the man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scripture where it says, The stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is salvation and no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. So Christ was living through Peter and John here. Just previously, a month or two previously to this, Peter had denied Jesus three times. They had all escaped. They didn't want to be seen with Jesus. They were afraid to speak out that they were even know that they even knew Jesus. And now fast forward a couple of months, and Peter and John are in front of all of these leaders and quite boldly speaking who Jesus was and blaming them. And y'all are the ones that sent him to the uh, to the cross, but he is the Son of God. So clearly there was a change in Peter and John from then to now. The change was obviously the Holy Spirit and the cost that happened in this time. Um, but we can see that Christ was living through them. We can even see there that uh, that the council said they could tell these were just, they knew that these were just ordinary, ordinary men with no special training in the scripture. But they spoke with boldness. That is what the Holy Spirit does in us. That Holy Spirit that went into Peter and John is that same Holy Spirit that is in each and every one of us here in this room. So I'm going to tell a story out of a book that Nellie and I are in the process of reading. It's a really good book. It's called I Will. But the story is going to, it is a real story that changed the name of the church. So I'm going to kind of paraphrase. The church is called Twin Springs Church. Change name, but the church was founded in about 1955. It's a very small church, there were just a few members, but in, in, in a town somewhere in the south. And as this town continued to grow, the church grew. The church ended up growing to, a, to about 450 people in 1985. Um, so 450 people, a really large church. You know, but the city had continued to grow. It just kind of grew with the city as the, as the city grew. There was a period of time, 1985, was where the church started to decline. Only started to decline about one person per month. But over the next 30 years, there was only 90 people in the church. So the church has 90 people in there. And it was just so gradual that no one even really realized. So that's kind of coming up to there. I'm going to read what it says in the book after I talk about that church. The church never developed a DNA of going. They rarely reached out beyond their own walls. The members became more inwardly focused. They focused more and more on their comfort and needs. The decline was inevitable and tragic. Today, the church of 90 in attendance is in, is in a large facility they cannot afford. It has been 12 years since Twin Springs Church had a full-time pastor. Cash reserves are totally depleted. I've seen it happen too many times. The church will close its doors in just a few years unless something dramatic and drastic takes place. I know. This story seems to be about the church's decline. 
While that is part of the story, it's not the main issue. The key issue is about those who were and are in the church. It's not an institutional story. It's about me and it's about you. You see, Twin Springs Church was once full of members who made a decision to let their church be about them. Few members invited people to church. Even fewer shared the gospel with others in the community. Twin Springs Church was about me, myself, and I. When a church declines, we often want to blame the pastor, or the church staff, or other church members, or the denomination, or circumstances. The reality is that church decline is the collective result of individuals who have decided that they will not go. The church thus becomes a religious country club instead of an obedient Great Commission congregation. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that you will be with us today, Lord, as we share your word, as we speak about your vision for our church, Lord, as we want to be obedient to you. I pray that you will open our ears, open our hearts to hear and see what you want us to hear and see. Lord, open our hearts to have a willing heart to be obedient to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So is Christ living through you in everything that you do? Is he walking with you through your everyday life? Are we focusing on things that are outside of these four walls? Who are in church? Who are in church, are we thinking about what's going on out there? Or are we just thinking about what's going on in here? Or do we separate our personal lives from our Christian life? You know, many times we say, yes, we... You know, if I asked you, you know, do you want to see people come to Christ? I would be willing to say that, be willing to admit that all of you would say, yes, of course we want people to come and see Christ. But are we being a part of that? Do we let that act through our lives, through our everyday lives? And maybe you do. You know, that would be great. You know, if we do, we need to continue doing that. Um, but if we don't, why aren't we? What is there that is stopping us from sharing who Jesus is? If we belong to Jesus, shouldn't he be a major part of everything that we do? Um, But it is one of the major reasons that churches decline throughout America. Over 70% of churches are in decline right now across America. 70% of churches are in decline. That is a huge number. Only 30% are growing. You know, why are people leaving the church? So why do y'all think people are leaving the church? One of the things is it is definitely our young people. Young people are leaving. um, And they're not getting, well, and adults are also leaving, but we are getting questions answered. So they come in and they have a lot of questions, which sometimes can be difficult questions. Sometimes they can be uncomfortable questions. Um, They come in and they they ask, well, why do you not, does the Bible teach that homosexuality is a sin or not? Sometimes it's kind of difficult. People say, oh, that's not a problem. I don't know what the Bible says. And so we can haul around it. Um, you know, well, is I'm living with my girlfriend or my boyfriend. Is, you know, is that a sin? Can, sometimes we're not straightforward. We don't really help people through answers. And a lot of times people start doubting whether God is good. Sometimes we start doubting whether God really loves us. Um, and doubt is a normal process for Christians. It's a normal process for non-Christians. John the Baptist doubted whether Jesus was the the Savior at one point in time. He's in jail. He is um, about to be beheaded, and he sends some of his disciples to go ask Jesus, are you really the Messiah? Are you sure you're the Messiah? And you know, if you all remember what Jesus said, Jesus started quoting the scripture, and he said, um, you know, the, the dead are being raised. Eyes are opening. People are being able to walk. People are being able to see. You know, he was quoting scripture that that would be the Messiah. Did Jesus get on to John the Baptist? No. He didn't talk down to him. He, he helped him through his issues. And when John saw it, he's like, okay, this is the Messiah. That's what we need to be doing as well. We need to be helping people through some of their issues. Rather than looking down or saying, I don't know the answer. I'm just not going to, let's just shut that question off. You know, it's, talk about, it's about discipling, helping people through problems that they're having, discipling people through. It's about a relationship. And you know, we have to have a relationship with the people that are around us. 
You know, is Christ living through you in your everyday walk? As you're talking, can people hear the love? Can people see the love coming through you? Can they see the, what Jesus is doing? Can they see something different in you? Um, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Ephesians 4, so this is Paul speaking here. He says, Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, Sometimes we read the Bible as though it's speaking to us. And the Bible is speaking to us. Um, so as we read it, we should read it that way. But we also should sometimes put ourselves in that reader's perspective. From that first person's perspective. Because Paul is saying, therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord. And then he starts talking to us. But we are also prisoners for serving the Lord. So we can easily be saying this. So sometimes we'll put, we'll put our uh, put ourselves in Paul's, Paul's spot there. So therefore I, prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. So where does that love come from? From the Holy Spirit. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit. Bind yourselves together with these. For there is one body. Who is that body? We are the body. And one Spirit, just as you've been called to one glorious hope for the future. You have been called by God. Think about that just for a minute. You, each of you, have been called by God. Specifically, for a reason. At the end of verse 1, there it says, For you have been called by God. Say, you have been called by God. Say, I have been called by God. I have been called by God. I have been called by God. You have. We have all been called by God. You know, you all know Acts 1-8. You don't have to turn there. But it says, but what you will receive power from the Holy Spirit to go, to preach, to be my witnesses, telling everybody in Jerusalem and uh, Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the world. I am huge when it comes to world missions. I love world missions. God's called us to be missionaries, um, but I am not talking about missions right now. Right now we're going to go to Jerusalem. Our Jerusalem is Ulysses. Our Jerusalem is here. Our Jerusalem is the high school. Our Jerusalem is our jobs. Our Jerusalem is the donut shop. It is where the hospital, the care centers, wherever we are, is here. This is our Jerusalem. It's our community. The Bible talks and says that we must go and we must proclaim to our Jerusalem. Matthew 28 says, go, go into all the world preaching, baptizing. That going and preaching wasn't to pe preachers. Going and preaching was to all of us. Preaching is just proclaiming who Jesus is. That's all it is. It's living Him through our lives and saying that Jesus did something in my life. He changed who I was. I was this, and now I am this, and He has done this in our lives. That's all pre sharing what the, the good news is. You know, Luke talks about the harvest is plentiful. You know, we live in western Kansas. Right now, the harvest is not plentiful. It's been so dry. But the harvest with souls is plentiful. There are a lot of souls here in Ulysses that are lost. And they are everywhere. The Bible says we just need workers. I believe that in this congregation here, we have a lot of workers for the Lord who wants to serve and wants to do something. Last week, we talked about, uh, I read 1 Corinthians 9, 22. Uh, we're going to repeat it because it really fits in very well with what we're doing. It said, when I am weak, when I, when I am with those who are weak, I share their weaknesses. For I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessing. We have to change who we are. We have to be Christians, but we have to adapt as well. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a young guy. I'm not a super old guy, but I'm not a young guy. And, you know, uh, Mickey and I went and had 
pizza the other night, and, and I think I felt like I was like a 17 year old and while, while, we were, while we were there. You know, sometimes we got to become somebody, you know, somebody that we aren't, and to be with those that we're with. Um, you know, when I go to with Carl to the donut shop, you know, and I, I become a little bit older and I start talking about things that I wasn't talking about with Nikki. Uh, you know, we sometimes we just we have to adapt. Well, we can't, we have to get out of our molds. So now we get so stuck in who we are, it's hard to open up and, and be with other people. But we have to let them feel comfortable around who we are. And for that to happen, we can't accept, expect everyone else to change to our likings. We need to change to them. Jesus went with sinners. He went with tax collectors. He went with, he was with prostitutes. He was with all, in all these different areas. And he never sinned. But he... He adapted himself so that he could open up doors to talk to those people. That's kind of what we need to do. You know, James chapter 2 talks about faith and works. It talks about, you know, he, he says, You show me your faith with, without, without good deeds, and I will show you my faith through good deeds. They go together. If we have faith, he's basically saying, If you say you have faith, yet there's no fruit coming out of that, then your faith is kind of dead. Um, if we have faith, if we say that we have faith in Jesus Christ, we say we have faith in the Trinity, we have faith that he has come in and he has transformed who we are, then there will be fruits that are going to come out of that. People are going to see that change in each and every one of us. There will be no question to the world whether we love God or whether we are of God or whether we are of the world. So is Christ living through you in your daily walk? Can people see and hear him in you? The Holy Spirit is really good at sometimes calling us outside of our comfort zone. We are, in, we are comfortable here, and he says, go and do this. But we don't want to. And it's easy to say no. It's easy to say, no, I don't want to go. No, I, that's, that, that's, I'm not comfortable going and doing that. I'm not comfortable sitting in the front of the church. I'm not comfortable um, getting in front of people and talking. I'm not comfortable um, you know, telling someone about Jesus outside of church. What if they look at me? What if they laugh at me? What if they get mad at me? What if I lose my job? You know, what if all these things happen? I guarantee you that Christ will take care of it. He says, seek me first. And then all these other things will happen. But sometimes we seek other things first and leave Jesus kind of on the back burner. Um, we need to seek him first. And so how many of you believe this Bible? How many of you believe what this says? How many of you believe in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? How many of you believe that he is in control? If we really believe that he is in control... If we believe that he has called us to go out, then why don't we? The lack of trust. Do we not trust what God has said? John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, talks a little bit about this. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my Father's house. If this were not so, would I have told you that I was going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you, so that you will always be with me where I am, and you know the way to where I am going. Now look what Thomas says here. No, we don't know, Lord, Thomas says. We have no idea where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. We need to validate people. Did Jesus get on to Thomas for doubting again? Doubting Thomas? Thomas like, I, we don't know. We don't understand. We don't understand how this whole thing is working. And I, I know I, I can speak for myself. I know many times I'm confused with a lot of stuff. And I don't understand what's going on. Um, you know, Jesus says, go do this or go do that. And I'm like, I don't know. That just doesn't make sense. And it's really getting me outside of my comfort zone. But Jesus doesn't get on to us. He guides us. He loves us. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Trust me, that very first, 
That very first uh, verse. Trust in God. Trust also in me. You know, the people that we come across, the people who are sometimes our stumbling blocks, our issue is not with them. Our problem is not with them. Our enemy is not the people. Our enemy is Satan. Our enemy is spiritual. We need to spend time on our knees. We need to spend time in prayer for those people that maybe are a comp that we have conflicts with. Let's pray for them. Let's pray for our hearts with them. Let's pray that there can be reconciliation there. Our, our problem is not with those people. Our problem is with Satan who is creating barriers in between relationships. So let's stop thinking that we may have all the answers. You know, sometimes we, or that we even need to have all the answers. We don't need to have all the answers. I do not have all the answers. I did not go to seminary. I did not graduate college. I don't have a whole lot of answers for a lot of things. And I don't claim to have a lot of answers. And if you ask me a question that I don't know, I will tell you, I don't know. You know, and, and, and I'm a pastor. So you know, if someone asks you a question about the Bible that you don't know, just say, I don't know. That's a great question. I'll try to find out the answer. And I may not be able to find out the answer. There are some questions about the Bible that there really isn't an answer for. Um, but we need to be prepared. Just, just be prepared to talk to people and not and know that we don't have all the answers. Know that you're not going to have all the answers. You know, this year, God has really put on my heart the community of Ulysses and meeting all of them. You know, this last week was a really tough week for me. I was sick from Tuesday, even now I'm not 100% good. Um, but I was in bed three days this week, and it was, Carl was like, I didn't see it. No, I shot except Monday. Monday was the only day I felt good. Uh, you know, so I have not been able to go out. I have not been able to talk to people. I have not been able to really do what I feel like God has pushed me to do this week. Pray that this week, this coming week, will be way different than that. Um, but our primary focus here at Ulysses Nazarene this next year will be our community. It will be reaching out. It will be going into all the world. Jesus said, go into all the world. He said, go into Ulysses. I'm not asking y'all to go to Wichita. I'm not asking y'all to go to Kansas City. Um, I'm not asking y'all to go to Africa. Here, in Ulysses. It has to start here. It really does have to start here. You know, and if you aren't, aren't on board, if you don't think that we need to reach people, then talk. let's talk to me after the service and, and we can talk about that. God has called us. Our mission here in our life is to reach people. God has placed the unchurched on my heart. He has placed the lost on my heart. Has he placed that on your heart? Do you have a burden for lost people? Do you have a burden for those lost friends of yours? For lost family members? Is there a burden on your heart? Does it weigh on you? You know, the mission statement for uh, Ulysses Nazarene. You turn your bulletin over and see the back of on, on that cross. It's a very short mission statement. Read that out loud with me. Following Christ into our community. Jesus is in our community. He is out there right now. The Holy Spirit is working on people that are out there right now. The first words from Jesus' ministry were, does anybody know? Follow me. So follow me and I will make you fishers of men. The first words of Jesus in, in the Bible, in his ministry, will follow me. We need to follow him. We need to go out into the community and do everything we possibly can. The apostles learned as they went. They were fishermen. Jesus said, follow me. And let's go. They began their ministry right there, then and there. There was no formal training. There wasn't anything. They went as they went. They learned as they went. And Christ taught them as they went. We need to do the same thing. We need to not say, well, I'm not ready. We are ready. Christ will let you be prepared as, you, as we go out. As all of us. It isn't just my job. Yes, I will absolutely do my part. I will absolutely do my part. God has pushed me into that. And I am not going back now. But it is each of our jobs as well. If evangelism is not number one in our church, 
then it will not happen. I was talking to uh, Mason the other day about it. I was like, you know, they, we have to focus. Our church has to focus. Otherwise, it will be just buried in a bunch of other things. You know, we must reach lost souls. You know, sometimes I, I was thinking this week as I was coming across it, doing writing the sermon and thinking about stuff. You know, we have, I believe, as not Nazarene church, but as a church in general, have become very institutionalized. We have thought, you know, I am Nazarene, I am Baptist, I'm Mennonite brethren, I'm Catholic, I'm, um, I'm whatever, and we have become very institutionalized rather than that we are Christian, we are Christ-like. We are to be like Christ. We are not to be like an Mennonite or like a Baptist or like a whatever. We are to be like Christ. How was Christ? Let's allow Christ to live through us. Paul's vision. But he left Antioch on his first missionary trip. His vision from the Lord was to reach all of Asia Minor. Asia Minor is now modern day Turkey. I know how big Turkey was, is big. It's bigger than Texas. I didn't realize Turkey was bigger than Texas. That is four Kansases. So that vision that Paul had, one man had, is huge. One person. Imagine walking all over Texas. And uh, you know, they didn't have cars back then. So imagine walking all over Texas and evangelizing all of Texas. Impossible. It really is. Um, so how do you do it? Because he did. He reached all of Asia Minor. By talking to others, by multiplying. As he met people, as he talked to people, they went and went. And the, and the church just started to spread all through Asia Minor. That could easily, we're not talking about all Kansas, we're talking about little Ulysses. And it can happen. But we need to pray for strength. Paul prayed and prayed and prayed in every single letter that he wrote. He prayed and he prayed. He wrote prayers down. He was constantly talking about how much he was praying. Paul is a prayer. We need to pray. The power of prayer is huge. We need to pray that God will give us strength, that He will give us guidance. We pray that God will open up doors and will give us the desire to actually reach out. I mean, if you have the desire right now to reach those that are around you, if you have that desire, if you don't, ask the Lord for it. He will give it to you. I promise you. Get on your knees and say, God, give me the desire. I, I want to. I really, I, I know I, I know that's what you want me to do, but I'm, I'm shy or I'm, I'm, I'm scared or whatever. He will help you through it. Ask God to take you out of your comfort zone. As we finish, we'll finish with this last section of verses here. It's from Isaiah chapter 6, 1 through 8. It says, it was in the year King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. With, six, with two wings they covered their faces, with two wings they covered their feet, and with two wings they flew. They were calling out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Their voices shook the temple to its foundation, and the entire building was filled with smoke. Then I said, It is all over. I am doomed, for I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips, and I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the King, the Lord of heaven's armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with the burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with it and said, See, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. Then I said to the Lord, Whom should I, then I heard the Lord asking, sorry, Whom should I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? I said, Here I am, send me. I say, Here I am, send me. Do each of you say, here I am, send me. We are one family. We are one body. We love each other. And we love those that are around us. And I thank God for each and every one of you. 
And I pray for each and every one of you daily. And this week, as we go out into our communities, as we go out among our friends, as we go out among our families, as we go out among strangers, remember, you are representing Jesus Christ. He is in you. Like Paul said, we are prisoners of Jesus Christ. 